All right. Great to see everybody. Got a good number here today, a good number in this Bible class. Uh, turn, please, to Job chapter 32 as we begin our study of God's Word. And it's, it's always a good time to remind us that studying God's Word is part of the spiritual growth process. But there's more to it than just studying God's Word. We need to worship God and study His Word and love one another and, and reach the lost. That's all part of the growth process. And uh, so let me grab my clicker real quick. Recently, uh, Brian and I have wrapped up um, the speeches of Job's three friends and Job himself. Brian uh, wrapped that up on Wednesday. So who were Job's three friends? Bildad, Eliphaz, Zophar. So in order, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, right? That's the order that they actually spoke to Job in all three speeches, except what was different about the third round of speeches? Uh, it was shorter, yeah. When, uh, well, Bildad's, uh, Eliphaz's was about normal, but Bildad's was really short, and then Zophar didn't talk at all. So anyway, those are over, and what we're going to get into now is this new character, and his name is Elihu. And uh, Elihu means he is my God. And there are four speeches by this man, and he, he really gives us some problems. This is really probably the most difficult section of the whole book of Job. And so um, we're going we're gonna to cover six chapters of the most difficult section uh, of, of the book of Job uh, this morning. So he's introduced, Elihu is introduced in chapter 32, 1 through 5. Then these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But the anger of Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzite, of the family of Ram, burned. Against Job his anger burned because he justified himself before God. And his anger burned against his three friends because they had found no answer yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were years older than he. Now when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of the three men, his anger burned. So one of the questions that comes up is where has Elihu been this whole time? Uh, he, he's never been introduced yet, uh, but it seems like he's been there this, this whole time. He's been listening to this whole discussion. Um, there were probably many who were listening to all of these discussions that were going on. So he's one of them. And we just have a lot of questions about the, the speeches that he gives and how we are to regard Elihu. Are, do we, you know, are we to regard the things that he says as being true or mostly true? Um, so it's kind of hard to say. So we're going to have to kind of judge for ourselves. I'll tell you some things that kind of make it a hard choice. Elihu says a lot of the same things that God later says. Okay, that's one reason. It, it adds credibility to Elihu. Also, um, Elihu's speeches are followed immediately by God's speeches. So it, al it almost seems like his speeches sort of set up God's speeches, and like they're really just one section. That also adds credibility, I think, to Elihu. At the end of the book, God criticizes Job's three friends. And they are, um, they are commanded, or Job is commanded to offer sacrifices for them. But is there any mention of Elihu and, and needing sacrifices? No. In fact, he's not mentioned again after his speeches are over. Um, so that might suggest that what he says is right. But what makes it difficult is a lot of the things he says sound just like Job's three friends. Maybe not a lot, but some of the things. Especially when he condemns Job. He's pretty harsh in his condemnation of Job. And so we kind of have to wrestle as we go through it. Is what he's saying right? Or is, is he right on a lot of things and wrong in some ways? Is he really condemning Job? Or is he just saying, Job, you, you just appear uh, by your words to be talking the way that wicked people talk? Or was he actually saying you're wicked? A, a lot of questions. And I, I can't give you all the answers, but we're just going to have to all kind of wrestle with that as we go through it. But this is going to be uh, a lot of fun. So chapters 32 and 33, this is the first speech of Elihu. And what he says in this first speech is, You three friends are wrong. Job, you have no right to complain or criticize God. Okay? So that's basically the first speech. 
And so he starts out there in verses 6 through 22, and he says that he waited for a long time to speak. For what reason? Why did he say that he was waiting to speak? Yeah, he thought these older guys, are, they got all the wisdom, so let them talk. And then what did he find out? They didn't have it. And, uh, uh, you know, we just have to realize that age and time do not necessarily equal wisdom. And so when he saw that they didn't have a good answer, uh, he, he's upset. And he just, he is chomping at the bits to just uh, give Job some wisdom. And so look in verses 19 through 22. We're in chapter 32, starting in verse 19. He says, but behold, my belly is like unvented wine, like new wineskins that is about to burst. So when, when uh, juice ferments, it expands. <laughs> verse uh, 20, let me speak that I may get relief. Let me open my lips and answer. Let me now be partial to no one nor flatter any man, for I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. Now that's a great lesson, just in passing, that we need to make sure that we don't seek to flatter and we speak the truth. It just really, he just seems to be very objective. And I, I really respect that about him. So he then says in chapter 33 and verses 1 through 7, Job, I am sincere and I am knowledgeable. Look at verse 3, 33, 3. My words are from the uprightness of my heart, and my lips speak knowledge sincerely. So he's not only indicating that he's got truth, uh, but he's also indicating what about his heart? He's got pure motives here, right? He, he's not just trying to bash Job here. Isn't that kind of what Job's three friends ended up doing? They may have kind of started out, off with good motives, but they, they end up kind of just defending themselves and just trying to defeat Job with their arguments. He, he kind of, Elihu kind of comes across to some people as arrogant. Do you think he's arrogant? I'm just curious. Could be, okay, so even to some here, he, he comes across as arrogant. It could be that he's just stating the truth, that he really does have the knowledge that Job needed to hear. Let's, let me hold off on comments just for a minute, if we don't mind, um, and then I'll open it up in, in just a minute. So uh, Elihu continues in, in this section saying that he knew Job was terrified to speak with God. But he's saying, you don't have to be terrified of me because I'm not God. So what he's kind of saying is, Job, you really want to have this like court case with God. Because Job, the thing about Job is he had all this suffering and he thought God was afflicting him unjustly. And he wanted to defend himself before God and get an answer for why this was happening. And so what Elihu is basically saying is, why don't we kind of have a pretend court case here? And I'll speak for God. And let's just kind of, let's just kind of practice it that way. But instead of waiting for Job to say anything, he goes ahead and responds to the things that Job has already said. Okay, well, you make, you make a good argument. Now let's read verses 8 through 12. I will, I will admit, I like Elihu, and I tend to want to defend him. I like him, but I want to be objective, because he could be dead wrong about things. But look, uh, look in verses 8 through 12. Now I think he is dead right about a lot of things, we have to admit. But let's read this. Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words. Now he starts quoting, kind of paraphrasing Job. Verse 9. I am pure without transgression. I am innocent, and there is no guilt in me. Behold, he, that is God, invents pretexts against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths. Behold, let me tell you, you are not right in this, for God is greater than man. Now, I want to notice something. Elihu bases his charges against Job on facts. You see that? The facts of what Job said. What did Job's other three friends base their charges against Job upon? Assumptions. What were those assumptions? He must have sinned. Because why? Because he's suffering. And people only suffer if they're terrible sinners. Well, and then they, they started even naming made-up sins that they never knew he committed because they had no evidence of it. Elihu is not like that. He bases what he says based on the words that he's heard Job say and his understanding that that, that is 
that is wrong. So let that be a lesson for us. If we're going to kind of confront somebody about something they've done, let it be based not on hearsay or presumption, but on facts, on facts. His point here is that Job is wrong in claiming that God unjustly attacked him. And uh, I can tell you, I've been wrestling with something the past several weeks we've been teaching Job. When people ask me how I'm doing, you guys know what I normally say. What do I normally say? Better than I deserve, right? I love that response. But I've been looking at Job, and, and, and we've been defending Job against his three friends. And what he's been telling his three friends is, I'm worse than I deserve. And I've been going, was he worse than he deserves? Or should I stop telling people I'm better than I deserve? And in a sense, yeah, Job was worse than he deserved because he didn't deserve this terrible suffering he was enduring. But at the same time, although Job was a righteous man, was he sinless? And what does any man deserve who has sinned? Death and separation from God. Job had life and he had a relationship with God. You could also argue that Job was actually better than he deserved. So I kind of was confused for a little while, but I came to the conclusion, I'm going to keep telling people I'm better than I deserve. <laughs> Even though I get cross-eyed looks at Publix when I tell the cashier that, because they're always like, well, I think you deserve what you have. Well, what a, what a great opportunity to tell people about the gospel. I don't actually deserve what I have because I'm a forgiven sinner, which means actually I deserve to be dead right now, and I, I don't deserve to have the hope of heaven, and I have all of that. And even if I was suffering horrifically like Job, really you could argue I'm still better than I deserve. So I've had to wrestle with that, and I, I think I've come to the right uh, conclusion on that. But it seems like part of what Elihu is saying is, Job, you're not worse than you deserve. You need to stop saying that. Next, in verses 13 through 33, he says, God does speak to men. He said, Job, you have complained that God doesn't speak to you. You want to take this court case before Him and He's not talking to you one-on-one -on -one like, a, like a, just a you know, real-time conversation. But He's saying, but God does speak to men. Maybe not in the way that you want, but He does speak to men. And He gives three ways that God speaks to men. Verses 13 through 18, what's the first way He says? In dreams and visions of the night. Is it hard to find Bible passages where that happens? Where God communicates with people in dreams and visions? No, that's easy to find. The second way is in verses 19 through 22, which is in suffering. And it, it seems that what he's saying to Job is, uh, you know, it, it may be that God is speaking to you through all this pain you're enduring, and you're not really listening. Maybe he's trying to teach you something. And had Job learned some things along the way? Yeah, so maybe Elihu has a point. The third way he says God speaks is through a messenger. Look at verses 23 through 28. We'll just read verse 23, uh, maybe 24. He says, If there is an angel as mediator for him, one out of a thousand, to remind a man what is right for him, then let him be gracious to him and say, Deliver him from going down to the pit, and so forth. Does anybody have a different word there in verse 23 than the word angel? Messenger. So the Hebrew word is messenger, and according to the context, we can translate that to mean like a divine being, like an angel, or just a person who's a messenger. Uh, so it could be that he's saying divine beings. It could be that he's saying just people. Elihu, you could, one could argue, he was kind of serving as a messenger to deliver some truths of God to, to Job. If people come to us and give us truth. Is that God speaking to us? In a way? Through them. It's indirectly. Yes. Yes, He did. He did to Balaam. That's right. Numbers 22 through 24. In James 5, James says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death. And cover a multitude of sins. If you're in sin and somebody confronts you to help you and they tell you truth, you could argue that's God, in a way, speaking to you through that person. 
right? And so it seems that that's the idea that, uh, that Elihu is getting at here. And I think that's a powerful point. I think another point of application is we need to be satisfied in the way God speaks to us today. You know, Job wanted this one-on-one conversation of just, I ask a question, I hear your answer, and we just kind of go back and forth like best friends here. Um, or like a, like a, not like best friends, but like somebody who's in a court setting with his judge. But he still wanted to speak with God directly. We may be frustrated that we can't just have a one-on-one direct conversation like that with God, but we need to be content with the way that God has chosen to reveal Himself to us uh, today. I want to read verses 29 through 33 as um, he ends his, this uh, speech. 33, 29 and following, he says, Behold, God does all these oftentimes with men, mean, meaning He communicates with men oftentimes these ways to bring back his soul from the pit, that he may be enlightened with the light of life. Pay attention, O Job. Listen to me. Keep silent and let me speak. Then, if you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, I, if not listen to me. Keep silent and I will teach you wisdom. Now, one thing that's very striking to me is when Elihu finishes his speeches, Job is speechless. For once. Now you could say, well, he didn't have a chance because God started speaking. But every time his other three friends spoke, was Job short on words? No. But when Elihu speaks, Job says nothing. One could argue that that suggests that Job knew he was right. And uh, I tend to lean to, to that position. All right, any thoughts on Elihu's first speech before we move into chapter 34? Let me start over here with John, if you still wanted to make that comment. Uh, well, you know, whatever, the, whatever what people want to think, arrogance or whatever, he may, it may appear like there's an arrogance or a self-righteousness there. But I, there's a part of me that kind of, you know, here you have this fourth man kind of sitting back. He's listening to these three guys kind of pointing their fingers over at Joe. And he's just probably shaking his head going, the folly of sure, these men. Sure. And that's kind of how I see it today when you see certain men who may have the, the outward <clears throat> appearance of uprightness. Yeah. Okay, and things like this. And they may have these beautiful, eloquent things that come out of their mouth and they may seem, you know, righteous sure, or sure. whatever. Sure. But their motives are not pure. Right. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, you can't, we cannot see the hearts of men. We only hear their words. Right. But sometimes actions speak louder than words. Right. And I think this guy was sitting here going, I've seen you guys in action. Yep. Okay. I agree. And he's probably taken a position of, I am tired of your hypocrisy. I am tired of you going blah, 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 blah. And so he's got <laughs> almost a righteous anger that he's starting to fight back at these men. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, in the introduction of, of Elihu, he's very angry. Yeah. His arrogance. Yeah. All right. Um, Jason, I, can you keep it a little short? Because I'm not going to have a whole lot of time for comments. But all right. I, I didn't mean to sound disrespectful there. But, <laughs> no, but uh, uh, I kind of agree with this. John said, I don't think he's arrogant. He's coming with the confidence that he is speaking in the knowledge of God. Okay. And, and what he Good does, thought. he says, this is the God who you worship, Job. Yeah. Remember who he is before you start making some of these outlandish statements. Right. Good. And he condemns the other men for assuming facts not in evidence. They're making things up. Right. The only thing he addresses with Job is what he has actually witnessed Job doing that he believes to be sinful. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so he's reminding Job of who his God is. Yeah. And I, I think... Instead of arrogant, he, he is placing all of his confidence in what he knows about his God. And we need to do that. We, we shouldn't assume things about our brother. Only speak the facts we know. And only in the context of how does that reflect in their relationship with God and what we know God to be. Well, let me just say, I agree, but I'm friends with anybody who disagrees. Because it's not, it's not as easy and cut and dry as I'd like it to be. And I can see both sides. I can see where people get really upset about Elihu. And, um, and so if you have that view, 
Um, we're still friends and brethren, and I'm not saying I'm right and you're wrong, but amen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know you, you feel that way too, Jason. I just want to clarify. So chapter 34, as we go into Elihu's second speech now, in summary, this speech is, he says this, the Almighty does not perverse justice, as Job claims. This is a fantastic speech. He starts out and he said, Job, your words are irrelevant. Uh, your words are irreverent. Irre I was going to say irrelevant. Irreverent. And he calls on the wise men to test Job's claims. Now, why would he probably not be talking about Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar when he speaks of wise men? He's already called them foolish. So I think that this is a clear indicator. There's kind of an assembly there. And there's these other men who are listening to all this that's going on. So just picture that. Here's Job still sitting on an ash heap, scraping his boils as he's having these intellectual discussions. But now he's just listening. And uh, pick up where I was. So he paraphrases uh, Job's claims of suffering innocently, and he condemns him of being an evildoer. I want to read verses 7 through 9 of chapter 34. He says, What man is like Job, who drinks up derision like water? who goes in company with the workers of iniquity and walks with wicked men. For he has said, it profits a man nothing when he is pleased with God. Some argue that he's just saying, Job, the words you're using make you appear to be wicked. But it reads to me like he's just saying, Job, you're, you're wicked. You're wicked because of what you've said. Again, he bases it on, uh, on facts. This is where it's a little difficult because Elihu sounds kind of like Job's three friends. And... We like to defend Job as not sinning throughout the book. And this is a real bugaboo for me, okay? It's difficult because, you know, in chapters 1 and 2, it tells us that Job did not sin with his lips, right? And you probably heard the argument, well, that's only chapters 1 and 2. It doesn't save that for the rest of the book. That's true, too. But at the end of the book, Job offers sacrifices for his three friends. But does God require him to offer sacrifices for himself? No, but... At the end of the speeches, what does Job have to do? What does Job do? He repents in dust and ashes, which people do when they've sinned. So I'm like, I can't exactly make my mind up. It is not my job to defend Job at every turn and to say he was sinless throughout the book. The only man who never sinned was God. And it is certainly not my job to say Job never made mistakes. He made mistakes. In this book, he charged God with being unjust. And that is not wise. And he is, he is put in his place by God, the creator of the universe himself, um, as we're going to study on, on Wednesday night. So I'm not exactly sure if I agree or not with Elihu, that Job was sinning or not. I'm starting to think that I agree with, with that, but I, I can't say for sure. But Elihu goes on and defends God's justice in three ways. And this is marvelous. This could make a wonderful sermon. The first point is God is in charge of the world. There in, in verses uh, 16 through 20. I mean, I'm sorry, 10 through 15. 10 through 15. He's saying, uh, Job, look at who you're viewing as being unfair. God. Did somebody appoint God to be in charge of the world? No way. He, he's, he's the highest authority. And he goes on to argue that we are so dependent upon God that if God withdrew His Spirit and breath from mankind, what would happen to us all? We would die. And that's the God we're complaining about? That's the God we're criticizing? The God who we rely on for every single breath we take? That's kind of the point he's making. I think that's a really good point. We need to be very careful about create, uh, criticizing the creator of the ends of the earth, the one who gives us life. Secondly, he created justice, verses 16 through 20. He says, he's saying, Job, think about whose justice you're questioning. He's God. He's the one who defines and created justice. He's the one who declares to kings that they are unjust. And that could be a lesson that Job needed to learn. And thirdly, he's saying God sees everything. He gets the information about who is innocent and who is guilty, not from trials and from eyewitnesses, but how? First hand, just because God sees and knows all things. And he ends his speech saying, Job speaks without knowledge as he criticizes God's justice. Look at verses 34 through 37. This is chapter 34, beginning of verse 34. 
Men of understanding will say to me, and a wise man who hears me, Job speaks without knowledge, and his words are without wisdom. Job ought to be tried to the limit, because he answers like wicked men, for he adds rebellion to his sin, and claps his hands among us, and multiplies his words against God. Difficult. Sounds like Job's three friends in a lot of ways, the way that they condemn Job. Some might argue here, well, he's not himself saying, Job, you're wicked, but he's actually quoting what wise men will say of Job based on what Job himself has said. That they will say, he's talking like a wicked person. There's a lesson. You may be a person who serves God, but we have to be careful how we talk about God to others or how we talk about our suffering because we might end up sounding like wicked people in our complaining. And, you know, what does uh, Philippians 2.14 say? Do all things without grumbling and disputing, that you may be blameless, lights in the world. If we do things with grumbling and complaining, we're no longer lights in this world. We're talking like wicked people talk. You see, that's, that's really <laughs> it's powerful. So I think Elihu makes a good point. Any comments or questions on the second speech before we jump into the, the third? Okay, go ahead, Jason. Think of us as sinners, but we're in a right relationship with God. There are other people who are not. They, they either are worshiping fallaciously uh, or not worshiping at all. And I think that's kind of the difference between Job and his three friends, which is why Job just needed to repent, whereas his friends needed a whole lot of prayer and sacrifice because they had a complete misconception of how to relate to God and how God wants to be to God. And, and, and so that's a different level of and I know a sin is a sin is a sin but, but there's something fundamentally incorrect with their relationship whereas even though Job was still a sinner and, and I think Elijah was correct that he was probably sinning in this instance and, and I think God bears that out himself later in the book I think that's the difference Adam uh, uh, in, in, in kind of where your mind's at at least my thoughts on it I'm probably not articulating it well but, but the idea is that we are still in the right relationship with God here because we, we, we've submitted in baptism. Right. We're trying to serve Him. We, we seek His forgiveness when we mess up. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, that's very good. Good, very good thoughts. Um, I, I appreciate that clarification. Does anybody else have any comments? Questions? Nothing? All right. So, third speech, chapter 35. Chapter 35. In this speech, Elihu is saying God is unaffected by your spiritual status. And I, I kind of phrased it differently on the screen than I did on my notes. He's saying you shouldn't question the benefit of serving God. And you shouldn't complain that He does not hear your prayers. So, verses 1 through 8, he's saying, uh, basically, in, in the context here, he's answering Job's question, what does it profit me to serve God? Remember when he did that, like back in chapter 23? I, I serve God and then I end up suffering. And sometimes we wonder that. What profit is there in serving God if I'm just going to suffer still? And what, what Elihu is saying in response is, well, what does it profit God for you to serve Him? And I just have to scratch my head on this one a little bit. Because I can understand his point in one sense. This is not a quid pro quo relationship with God where... There's benefits on both sides, and God gets something out of it, and we get something out of it. On one hand, I can see that totally. And I think the ultimate point he's making is, Job, you need to take your attention off of yourself and think about God in this whole situation. So I can understand his point there, but does, it, does this mean that God doesn't get any benefit from our serving Him at all? I talked about it in my Lord's Supper talk. God glories in our obedience. He takes great pleasure in His, his righteous uh, servants. Absolutely, there is something He can glean in that sense. But I don't think Elihu is talking about that sense. The second point he makes in verses 9 through 16 is God won't hear someone who criticizes Him. <laughs> he said, you complain that God doesn't hear you when you pray to Him and answer you, and yet you want God now to listen to you when you're complaining that He hasn't adjudicated you on your timetable. It's a, it's a great lesson. Be careful not to fall into the trap of wanting something from God and then being critical of how God runs the world. 
Those two things don't fit. It's like a child coming to his mom or dad and saying, I think you guys are unfair. Now, can I have a popsicle? <laughs> you know, they do that in the, at the same breath, right? It's just, that doesn't fit, child. It doesn't fit for us to want to criticize God and question God and then say, God, I need you. That doesn't work. It doesn't fit. And so I think this is a tremendous lesson. So we didn't spend as much time on that speech. Uh, any thoughts on that third speech before we move over or questions before we move on? Joe. Uh, the one point you made about where he's saying, you know, you being critical and stuff, he's saying that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And this is kind of jumping ahead, but we never tell him what's right because we don't even know that. Right. So we're just saying what's wrong, but we don't know what's right. Good point. You know, we, <clears throat> only God knows that. Yes. So how presumptuous it is of us to tell God wrong, but we don't even know. That's right. Great point. And going back to what Elihu was saying, um, God's the one who created justice. You know, so how can we question his justice when he's the one who created the whole concept and created us with our brains to even understand anything? Uh, yeah, of course, that wasn't exactly what Elihu said. That's what I said. But Jason? I think we also need to remember that this was not, when God says in the beginning, consider my servant Job, he didn't say who has never sinned or who does not sin. And Satan's query to God wasn't, uh, well, I bet you I can get Job to sin. His query was, I can get Job to forsake. That's a great point. Yeah, so he, even if Job did sin, I'm glad you said that, Jason, because even if Job did sin in the book, and I kind of leaned to the position that maybe he did, it doesn't mean that he forsook God. Do we forsake God just because we've sinned? No. Uh, you know, part of serving God means we're going to fall down. And as long as we keep picking ourselves back up and keep serving Him, then... That's at the end of the story, that's faithfulness. That's faithfulness. That was a great point. So, good. Any other thoughts or questions before moving on? Okay. So, chapters 36 and 37, Elihu's fourth and final speech. Oh, this one gets really good. He says in this speech, uh, God warns through suffering, and He is all-powerful, thus above questioning. So he starts out on 1 through 4, sounding arrogant in, in, in the mind of some people, saying, my words are not false and everything. And, uh, but again, he may just be expressing confidence that Job needs to listen because he has the truth. In uh, verses 5 through 15, he says, God uses affliction to lead men to repentance. What he's saying in this section is, godless people, despite the fact that God is righteous... Despite the fact that God renders justice, they still harbor resentment against Him. And when He does punish them for their sin, instead of them repenting, what does Elihu say they do instead? When God afflicts them. They become more resentful. They become more resentful, which leads them further into sin. They even go to the ultimate sin with male homosexual prostitutes at the temple. That's what Elihu is saying in this, in this section. And, and what a great point that sometimes when the consequences of sin come back to bite us, uh, sometimes what happens to people is they then become bitter against God because of the bad things that are happening in their life. And what does that bitterness lead them to do? To be more bitter? To turn to worldliness and sin and crime maybe and all sorts of terrible things? Phil? Phil? When God came to Pharaoh and told him to let his people go, mm -hmm. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, not because God hardened and took away his free will, but he knew that his heart was turned against God even before God gave him that command. He wow. knew how he was going to respond. Good insight. So then Job, I mean, Elihu turns his attention to Job, and verses 16 through 21 says, you need to be careful not to turn to evil. He's saying, be careful that you don't do what wicked people do who are resentful and turn uh, further away from God when God punishes them. He's saying what God is trying to do with all that suffering, and we need to realize this, is He's trying to woo people away from the jaws of distress. He's trying to save you. He's trying to help you through that, through that suffering. 
Sometimes He disciplines the righteous to, to just prevent them from the suffering that awaits the wicked. Um, now, that's not actually why Job's suffering happened from what we see, but there could be more in God's mind and plan than we, than we have revealed to us. One thing he's saying here in a general way is God has a good intention with your suffering. What Job assumed is God has bad intentions with this because what did he say about God? He said he was unfair. He's unfair. He's treating me like what? Like an enemy, like, an, like a sinner, like an adversary. He sets me up as a target like people are going to go and shoot arrows at. Right? He runs at me like a warrior, chapter 16. All, all those, those thoughts. And so what Elihu is saying is, no, God has good intentions with this suffering. And Job needed to reset his thinking. We need to reset our thinking. When we're suffering, to look at that suffering and say, all right, this is awful, and I might be really confused, and I might not deserve this, but God has good intentions with this. And if I allow this suffering to improve me, it will do just that. It's a change in, in our mental map. He then ends uh, in, in verses 22 all the way through the end of chapter 37 with a really grand, sweeping, epic part of his sermon, of his speech, saying you cannot bring a case against an omnipotent God. He talks about the greatness of God. I want to look at verses 22 and 23, chapter 36. Behold, God is exalted in power. Who is a teacher like Him? Who has appointed Him His way? And who has said, you have done wrong? This sounds, it, it reminds me a little bit of what Paul said in Romans 9. When he said, on the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? That's an entirely different context, but he's talking about the sovereignty of God and not questioning God. Or Romans 11, when Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become His counselor? See, who's going to tell God what to do? Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I was very um, stricken by the fact that when I looked at the center column reference and, and other uh, references and, and other sources that I have for the things that Paul says when he talks about the sovereignty of God, there are lots of references to the book of Job. Lots of references to the book of Job and Isaiah 40 and 41. But he says a lot of the same things that Elihu is arguing here. And so what he goes on to say here is, uh, what Elihu goes on to say is, Job, you're treating God like a human being that you want to take to court. But God is not like man. He's exalted. He's eternal. He's in control of the rain. He's in control of the terrifying, mighty lightning. And he really gives a lot of attention to that. And he keeps talking about that through the end of chapter 36 and into chapter 37, talking about lightning. Does, does lightning kind of bring you a little bit to your knees in, in respect and awe and thunder of, of the power of our God? Absolutely. And then he talks about that God is in charge of the snowy storms that freeze the waters. And what he's saying is, how can you complain against a God like that? How, how can you criticize or question that God? Great point. Look in chapter 37, starting in verse 14. I, I love this. He says, listen to this, O Job. Stand and consider the wonders of God. Do you know how God establishes them and makes the lightning of His cloud to shine? Do you know about the layers of the thick clouds, the wonders of one perfect in knowledge? You whose garments are hot when the land is still because of the south wind. Can you with Him spread out the skies strong as a molten mirror? Teach us what we shall say to Him. We cannot arrange our case because of darkness. That's like... Lack of understanding, lack of knowledge, darkness. That's powerful. What does this kind of remind you of? If you, 
if you've read the rest of the book of Job. That's right. This sounds almost exactly like what God says. Right? Can you lay the foundations of the world? Were you with me when I did that? And all those questions he asks is we're going to talk about on Wednesday. So again, that adds credibility to Elihu. That Elihu is making the same arguments as God. And ironically, he's saying you cannot bring a case against an omnipotent God. And the very next thing that happens after he gets finished with his speech is God confronts Job. So it's like he's, he's setting up God's speech in some, in some ways. And I, I, I just, all of that added together just gives so much credibility in my mind to, uh, to Elihu. <coughs> so I talked really fast, and I have a little bit more that I can say. But we do have a few minutes. This is very unusual. Comments, questions, Terry. So I see three, uh, three distinction between Elihu and the other three. Whereas the other three were kind of criticizing Job for what he did before the calamity and saying he did this and that and that. Having this attitude of I'm going to bring you down and make us look better, perhaps. Um, Elihu says and addresses what he's doing after the event, and the words and speech and you know, questioning God and criticizing God after the event. Right. So to me, I see a clear distinction. This almost seems like a righteous indignation. Yeah. Like, how dare you question God? Mm-hmm. So I think maybe you know, the perspective where the truth on this part is their own. Yeah. That's, that's, a really, that's a really excellent point. Um, it's almost like if, if there was somebody that's getting accused of wickedness and they're defending themselves, but in their defense of themselves, they have this rotten attitude and they, they exhibit a very ungodly attitude and you're an observer of that and you go, well, I don't know what happened before all this, but hey, mister, you shouldn't be acting that way in this conversation right now. Uh, I think that was a, a great observation. Um, very good. Did I see any other hands over here? I thought I saw a little hand or two. Matt and then Jason. Well, on Jason's earlier point, that's, you know, whether Job was sinning and, or not, you know, it kind of be both, I think, of the Psalms. You know, some of the Psalms start out, oh, you've forsaken me forever. Well, did God really forsake her? No, but he felt that way. By the end of the Psalm, usually it comes to praising God. Right. So Job is justified in feeling pain, depression, you know, why am I hurting this horrible? I don't right. like this. It's right. miserable. Right. That was okay to feel that way. But the problem comes when you say, oh, well, God, you're being unfair. You're doing this. You're doing that. So I think you know, that's where, for us, it's okay to say, God, I don't like this. Yeah. This is awful. Yeah. I don't know what to do. I'm confused and hurting. Sure, sure. But then when we start accusing, oh, you're yes, doing this. Yes. So there's a difference. That's, that's a good difference. distinction. So like Jason said, it's not about whether you're sinless. Right. That he forsake God. So we can struggle and hurt. Sure. But take that to God. Yeah. Accusing God. A point I was going to make, and I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to make it because I'm still wrapping my mind around it. Um, I, I read this book called QBQ, Question Behind the Question by John Miller. And a QBQ is a question that exhibits and leads you to think of personal responsibility. So a, a QBQ is a question that starts with a what or a how not a why or a when, and so on and so forth. It starts with a what or a how, it contains an I, and it indicates action, right? So what can I do to, you know, help improve this situation, you know? Um, How can I improve myself and my attitude toward this or that individual? Those other questions in the book, He calls them IQs, incorrect questions. So they don't start with a what or how. They don't contain the letter I, and they don't have anything to do with action of yourself. So why is this happening to me? It's not actually a really helpful question. We might ask it sometimes, but is that question really going to get you anywhere? Right? Uh, You know, when is... My boss is going to give me a raise. You know, is that, that's probably not going to help any either, right? So I think one thing we learn in Job is we may have the right to ask certain questions and be careful that our attitude is not wrong, but we don't need to give ourselves too much license. We need to be careful not to give ourselves too much license to think, you know, I can just question God all the time. As long as I do it with the right attitude, we just need to be careful because that can lead. It can lead to sin, and it 
can lead you away from thinking of personal responsibility, which at the end of the day, all we can do is respond to our suffering in the right way as a choice, right? So, sorry, I know some others had some comments. I didn't mean to talk that long on that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, please read through Job 42. The syllabus is wrong. It says through 41. And uh, please read through Job 42 for Wednesday and be ready for, for class. Thank you.